Order. It being almost 2 p.m., the committee reports progress. Order. The uh, committee reports progress. Order. Before proceeding to questions without notice, I draw the attention of honourable senators to the presence in the chamber of a parliamentary delegation from the Solomon Islands led by the Prime Minister Gordon Darcy Lilo. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and in particular to the Senate. Questions without notice, Senator Joyce. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. I refer the Minister to her answer to a question from Senator Cormann yesterday, in which she compared carbon pricing in Europe with that in Australia. Is the Minister aware that under the European Union's ETS, the EU expects to impose a 1,974 million tonnes of carbon cap on emissions in 2013? At current market prices of $9.10 per tonne, that's Australian, the value of these permits would be $18 billion. Given that there are 512 million people in countries covered by the EU's ETS, this means that Europeans will pay just $35 per person in carbon taxes in 2013. In contrast, Labor expects to raise $7.7 billion in revenue from the sale of permits this financial year, equating to $340 per Australian. Does the minister accept that, in per-person terms, Australia's carbon tax is at least nine times bigger than Europe's ETS? Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. Well, Mr. President, I certainly accept that the most expensive climate policy on offer is that that Senator Joyce uh, supports, which is $1,300 per household every year. $1,300 every year in more tax as a result of the cost of your policy. So, if the senator really cares about per capita or per household costs, perhaps he should explain to the uh, the electors of uh, oh, it's not New England, is it? Whichever one he's going to to, to get eventually in his mind, uh, why it is why it is that uh, he supports a policy that will cost them more. Why it is that he supports a policy that will cost them more? Order, uh, Senator Wong, resume your seat. Senator Joyce. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, point of order on relevance. Um, the question is Does the minister accept, in per person terms, that Australia's carbon tax is at least nine times bigger than Europe's ETS? That is the question for the minister for sending people to Manus Island and Nauru. Order. Order. I, I, I do draw the minister's attention to the question. The minister has one minute twenty remaining. The minister. What are you going to do? The Minister. Order. After me. Order. The Minister. Well, Mr. President, I know there's a lot of sookiness uh, with the blokes on that side who don't like uh, any scrutiny of their policy failure. They don't like any scrutiny of their policy failure. And every time we mention the fact that they go, their policy will cost more, they want to jump up and say, oh, that's not relevant to the debate. Well, the debate is about how you get to 5 per cent, Senator. That is the debate. And we on this side have an economically responsible policy with tax cuts and additional benefits through the pension and family tax benefit system, all of which you oppose. You want to impose a higher cost on the economy, a higher cost on pensioners, a higher cost on families uh, for your policy. Uh, and in terms of the international situation, I'd invite Senator Joyce to read, to read uh, the recent report from the Climate Commission, which has been released, which concludes that 90 countries representing 90 per cent of the global economy have committed to reduce their carbon pollution and have policies in place to achieve their reduction. Many of their con these countries rely on a market-based mechanism, and by next year around 850 million people will be living in a country, state or city with an emissions trading scheme, including countries like the UK, Germany, France, Sweden, Norway, New Zealand and Switzerland. Those are the relevant international facts. I know that Senator Joyce, Joyce doesn't Time's want to acknowledge expired. that. Senator Joyce. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My supplementary is to the minister. Um, why does the minister persist in comparing Labor's carbon tax with countries that generate most of the electricity from renewable hydro sources? For instance, yesterday she compared us to Norway, which gets 98 per cent of their electricity from hydro, with Sweden and Switzerland, which gets 40 per cent of their electricity from nuclear. Um, 
Who do, how does the minister defend her comparison to countries that are so unlike her Australia, or is she proposing that we dam, make new dams or build nuclear power plants? The, the minister. Well, I'm still reeling, Senator. I'm still reeling. Uh, well, Senator, uh, I think it is relevant to get the facts on the table. Uh, you obviously disagree. I think it is relevant to get the, tax on, the facts on the table about the prices, the prices that are that are a part of your policy, about the prices which are in place in other parts of the world, uh, and about the relative costs of the government scheme versus your scheme. Uh, we, we do believe that's relevant. Uh, those opposite uh, may choose to ignore these facts. Uh, I know that the senator does re re regularly ignore these facts, but the reality is uh, the world is, the world is uh, acting on climate change. Uh, the coalition is committed to the same policy. Senator Joyce might have missed that. He might have missed that, but they've committed to the same policy objective. The difference is their policy will cost families more. Senator Joyce. Uh, Mr. President, I ask a further supplementary. I refer to the fact that regional greenhouse gas initiative in the United States has just raised six dollars per person for the year. The New Zealand government has forecast the carbon revenues of less than thirty-five dollars per person in 2012. China expects any carbon price to start below two dollars a tonne. Can the minister name any country, any country in the world, which raises anywhere near three hundred and forty dollars per person that Australia does? Or are we just going to be stuck with the biggest carbon tax in the world? The, the minister. Thank you, Mr. President. I certainly can't name a country that has a price of $1,300 per household for every year uh, for a decade. But well, that's what we've got on offer over there: $1,300 per household for every year up to 2020 to get to the same target as the government. Just because, just because. Those National Party members are running economic policy over there, and the Liberal Party, under Mr Rabbit, have walked away from a market mechanism and a price on carbon to a, a scheme funded by taxpayers, administered by bureaucrats, that will cost Australians more. That is the reality. Order. That is the S Senator Wong, cost just on resume your seat as Senator Joyce has stood. Senator Joyce? Uh, it's a point of order on relevance. Um, I've directly asked the question can she name any country in the world that um, is going to pay more than $340 per person per year. Um, I can understand why she'd be upset with uh, the National Party having their say. After all, the left of the doormats that's, of the Labor Party. I can understand it. why she'd be upset. Uh, that's now debating it, Senator Joyce. There's no, there's no point of order. The minister has 27 seconds remaining. The minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, I'd again invite. I don't accept the senator's figures. If he wants to go down the per capita route then he would know that we are also the highest per capita emitter of any advanced economy in the world. So I would suggest to him that you can't have it both ways if you want to go down the per capita route, and that, that, that is the reality. But the more important issue is this. He has signed up to the same target. His policy costs families more. Order. Before I call the next person for a question, I draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the chamber of a parliamentary delegation from the United Kingdom led by the Right Honourable the Lord Graycott MP on behalf of all senators. I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and in particular to the Senate. Senator Polly. Order. Senator Polly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Bob Carr. Can the Minister update the Senate on the progress of the regional assistance mission to the Solomon Islands? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Bob Carr. Mr. President, I wish to acknowledge the distinguished presence in the uh, chamber of the Prime Minister of Solomon Islands, the Honourable Gordon Darcy Lilo, and his delegation. We are honoured to have the Prime Minister visit Australia as a guest of government. Prime Minister Lilo is no stranger to this country. He studied under an AusAid scholarship at the Australian National University. The Prime Minister's visit comes directly after my visit to Solomon Islands this weekend. I was pleased to see the progress that Solomon Islands has made. With the help of Ra Ramsey, the regional assistance mission to Solomon Islands, since 2003 we've seen 
domestic revenue collected by Solomon Island government grow at an annual approximate average of 20 per cent between 2006 and 2011, allowing essential services to continue. There has been improved debt sustainability measured by debt to GDP ratio from 23 per cent to 18 per cent, seeing it well below the accepted benchmark of 30 per cent. Over 2,500 public servants have trained in the last three years in better administration and financial management. So, Mr. President, the country is stable, the economy is growing, people's lives are getting better. This could be a description of Australia under the present government. <laughs> I know that's the view the opposition is forming as I rehearse these encouraging figures. The country's stable, the country's stable, the economy is growing, people's lives people's lives are getting better and many challenges remain but Solomon Islands and its people have more opportunities and brighter prospects for its future. Senator Polly. Thank you Mr President. My first supplementary to the minister. Can the minister advise the Senate on Ramsay's transition? The minister. Mr President, Australia has been proud to lead Ramsey, it's been a great regional endeavour. All Pacific Islands Forum countries have contributed personnel and shared its success. Based on the firm foundations of its achievements, Ramsey is now in transition. In consultation with Solomon Islands and our regional partners, we are planning for the withdrawal of Ramsey's military component in the second half of 2013. Civilian activities will transition to Australia's bilateral aid program and the program of other donors. A robust Ramsey police presence will continue building the capacity of the Solomon Islands Police Force. Australia's strong commitment to our bilateral partnership with Solomon Islands will continue. As I said on the weekend, Mr President, we will be there as long as the people of Solomon Islands need us. Time has expired for answering the question. Senator Polly. My second supplementary to the minister. Can the minister advise the Senate on the future focus of Australia's aid program to the Solomon Islands? The minister. Mr President, our development part partnership with Solomon Islands is strong. Over 2012 to 2013, Australia's aid to Solomon Islands will first help over 150,000 children stay at school by supporting tuition-free basic education. Two, will improve access to clean water and sanitation for 15,000 people in rural communities. And three, will build over 370 kilometres of road to improve access to markets and generate employment. This builds on our success to date. Australia's aid has helped ensure that 86 per cent of women now deliver their babies with a skilled birth attendant present. It's reduced malaria to 46 cases per 1,000 people in 2011, down from 199 in 2003. More than 140,000 young Solomon Islanders get an education in 2011. Time's expired. As a result, Senator Bob Carr, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. I refer the minister to reports in our hometown paper, the Adelaide Advertiser, that indicate local footy clubs are facing a $30,000 to $50,000 a year increase in their electricity bills, partly as a result of the carbon tax. Order. That's, not, that's not my order. care. That's not my care. That order. One, uh, order. Just order. Can we Court leave years. the football season alone? Um, <laughs> send a Birmingham. Uh, thank you, Mr. President facing a $30,000 to $50,000 increase in their electricity bills, partly as a result of the carbon tax, and that as a result they may need to axe or reduce their involvement in programs that promote community and school involvement in sports. I ask the minister, is the government providing any direct assistance under its carbon tax package to the West Adelaide Football Club, Central Districts Football Club or South Adelaide Football Club to assist with their increased costs and ensure they aren't reducing local community programs. 
Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. And can I take this opportunity to congratulate Senator Birmingham on his appearance on Q and A for the first and time last night? I have to say, judging Sen from Senator Wong, come to I will, the question. I will come to the. I just thought the, the chamber should be aware. I think he did very well. I, I suspect from the tweets that Senator Cameron might have bested him. However, Senator Cameron might have bested him. But I'm very happy to take a, a not entirely unexpected question. A not not entirely unexpected question uh, from Senator Birmingham, uh, and as he would know, and he was careful to word his question uh, perhaps a little more subtly than Senator Joyce would have been capable of. He, did, uh, he does know it is misleading to attribute, attribute the entire electricity price rise experienced by clubs or, in fact, any other entity to the carbon price. I am advised that the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency's office spoke to West Adelaide Football Club this morning, who confirmed that around half of the price rise quoted today was due to network costs. It is the case, and the government has been. Well, I, I ta I'll, take, I'll take the interjection Order. because. Ignore the interjection, Senator Wong. Oh, but Senator, address the Mr. Question. President, it's so tempting. I, it might be <laughs> tempting, but address the chair and, and address the Through question. Through you, Mr. President. Thank you. Senator as Wong. I said, uh, it is misleading Sen to uh, order. Senator Wong is entitled to be heard in silence. Senator Wong, continue. Mr. President, it is misleading to attribute the entire uh, price rise uh, to, to the carbon price. Uh, I would, would point out that uh, two points. One is the Treasury modelling did, did estimate uh, uh, the impact of the carbon price on sport and recreation of about 0.3 per cent. That's about 20 cents a week. Uh, that did include the impact on football clubs. Uh, the, go the government did assume uh, cost pass-through. <laughs> Uh, in its assessment of the household assistance package, which provides, as the Chamber would know, about $10.10 in assistance through tax cuts and increased transfer payments. In addition, football clubs may be eligible to apply for the Community Energy Efficiency Program, a $200 million funding stream for community organisations to retrofit facilities. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. A uh, supplementary question to the Minister, and I refer the Minister uh, to reports from last week, also in the Advertiser, that indicate the Belair Hotel has faced a 45 per cent jump in the off peak component of its monthly power bill due to the carbon tax, resulting in a rise in costs of more than $4,000 for July alone, partly attributable to the carbon tax, which is impacting on their ability to sponsor or support community events. Is the government providing any direct assistance to any South Australian hotel or club to meet their additional carbon tax costs and support the maintenance of community programs? Order. The Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I, uh, this, this question was asked last week by the member for Boothby, uh, and uh, a number of us know the Belair Hotel uh, reasonably well. Um, <laughs> I think, I, think Senator, I think Senator McEwen might know it pretty well, to be honest with you. She still lives up in the hills. Uh, uh, I understand from the information that was provided as a result of uh, the member for Boothby's question is that uh, of the uh, uh, increase in the off-peak rate to which the senator referred, uh, uh, the, the, uh, in fact, the overall carbon, carbon effect was less than 10 per cent of the overall electricity bill. There were significant increases in network charges, which added, I'm advised, over $1,300 a month to the hotel's electricity costs. Uh, so again, this is another one of those situations where uh, the carbon impact uh, uh, is a particular amount. The government has assessed that in terms of its assistance to consumers, uh, but of course there is obviously uh, there are obviously substantial increases driven by network costs. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. Further supplementary. Uh, given the minister has failed, uh, despite all of Labor's rhetoric about carbon tax compensation, to identify one piece of assistance given to local footy clubs, other clubs generally, or pubs in her home state, will the minister confirm that these organisations simply have to wear the costs associated with Labor's carbon tax? Isn't it an inevitable consequence of the increased carbon tax costs that support for worthwhile local community programs by these clubs? will be reduced. The Minister. 
Well, I don't agree with the premise of the question, and that wasn't the answer I gave. The difficulty is that Senator Birmingham, Senator Birmingham is written is writing the questions before he hears the answers, and is writing the questions with complete disregard for the facts. And he might want to know that over 300,000 pensioners in South Australia will receive an additional $338 extra per year if they're single, and up to 510 per year for couples combined in their pension payments. More than 127,000 families in South Australia will receive assistance through their family assistance. Payment. Payments. More than 19,000 self-funded retirees will receive additional assistance. Uh, more than 56,000 job seekers will get additional assistance uh, through per year. More than 25,000 uh, single parents in SA will get an extra $289 a year. And more than 27,600 students in SA will get additional assistance under our package, but will not get a single cent. Will not get a single cent. Just more tax under your senator. Senator Wright. President, my question is to Senator Kim Carr, representing the Minister for School Education. Yesterday, the Prime Minister told the Independent Schools Association that all independent schools would receive an increase in funding under the government's plans. Will the Minister make the same commitment to an increase in funding for all public schools? The Minister representing the Minister for School Education, Senator Kim Carr. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question, Senator Wright. Uh, the government has made it very clear that all schools, all schools uh, in Australia, the nearly 10,000 of them, will receive extra funding, whether they be Catholic schools, whether they be independent schools, whether they be public schools. What uh, I can say to you, Senator, is that the great hallmark, the great hallmark of the Labor Party in this country has been our commitment, our commitment to education. Our number one priority has been education. I can say this to you, Senator, what attracted me to join the Labor Party in the mid-70s was our commitment on the Whitlam government, our commitment to equality of opportunity for all Australians. And education, of course, is the critical vehicle by which that has been done. It has remained our consistent position right throughout throughout our, our, the modern times, our commitment to ensure equality of opportunity for all Australians. And that is why this government has doubled the level of investment to $13.9 billion, $13.9 billion compared to the $8.5 billion under the Howard government that was spent on school education. What we have seen on the other side of the chamber is a fundamental commitment to injustice to injustice because only yesterday only yesterday the leader of the opposition made it very clear when he said in terms of education funding he said so there is no question of injustice to public schools here if anything the injustice is the other way the view of the opposition is that public schools get too much money the opposition position is that public education is overfunded. That is what that is the measure. We talk a lot about class politics in this country. Well, we're seeing something of their class politics here. Time has expired, Senator Kim. Order, order. Now, when there's silence on both sides, we'll proceed. Order. Senator Wright. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Minister, for your answer. The Gonski recommendations are about improving our education system. They're designed to provide every child in Australia with the best educational opportunities, irrespective of their background or where they live. Does the minister agree that our public schools should be the benchmark for good quality education in Australia and that they are the only way of guaranteeing that every child can access the very best educational opportunities throughout the country? The minister. Um, Mr President, Labor has always believed that education is in very, very important. Our, our, our critical priority of Labor in government has been investment in education, and we are committed to ensure that every child in this country gets a fair go. Every child. Now, we take the premise because in public education, public education in this country is dependent on the proposition that everybody that walks through the door is entitled to a place. Everybody that walks through the door gets a place in public schools. That is the big difference, I might say, in terms of the education system. There is no discrimination 
in public education. Our commitment is to ensure that every child gets a fair go and that in particular the state education, the public education, is properly funded to ensure that there is genuine equality of opportunity for all Australians in this country. That is the premise of a decent country. That is the premise of a social democracy. Order. Senator Wright. Thank you, Mr. President. A supplementary for the minister. The opposition spokesperson on education, the member for Sturt, Christopher Pine, is quoted today as saying the opposition will increase funding to all schools. The opposition has previously announced proposed cuts to education totalling $2.8 billion. Can the minister explain how it would be possible to increase funding to all schools at the same time as making such cuts? Order. 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 Now, when there's silence, we'll proceed. The Minister. The opposition plans to cut funding for schools, and on, on my count, the, the latest count, is by the figure of $2.8 billion. You are correct in that number. We have heard, we have heard a lot about their attitudes to teachers. We've heard a lot about their attitudes to trade training. We've heard a lot about their attitudes, of course, to TAFE cuts, which we're now seeing through the states. We're seeing, for instance, in the state of Victoria, when Liberal governments get into office, massive cuts—550 people out of the education department in Victoria. We've seen the cuts in Queensland. There is a long established pattern. Under Jeff Kennett, we saw the closure of over 300 schools in my state. We have, of course, seen a pattern of behaviour towards public education exhibited by the Conservative Party in this country that goes back generations. This is the standing orders of the Liberal Party. When it comes to cutting the budget, you start with the schools. You start particularly with public education. So there is no doubt in my mind that they will implement Order. that promise. Order. $2.8 Senator billion Kim Carr, your cuts. time's expired. Senator Edwards. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. I refer the Minister to reports that Pete's Fish Farm, a rainbow trout producer in Kalangadu in the southeast of her home state of South Australia, will close within the next 12 months as a result of increases in their electricity costs. Their electricity rate has increased from 27.7 cents to 36.39 cents a kilowatt hour following the introduction of the carbon tax, making their business unviable. What is the government's message to businesses like Pete's Fish Farm, who as a result of the carbon tax cannot afford the increases in their power prices and, as a consequence, close their business? The Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, well, I don't have personal knowledge of Pete's fish farm at Kalangadu, uh, but. Order. 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 It's an echo at the Order. end of the chamber. Um, <clears throat> Senator Wong. It's a hollow echo. Senator Wong, just resume your seat. And when there's silence, we'll proceed. The Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I, no, I don't have, as I said, personal knowledge of um, uh, the fish farm at Kalangadu to which the Senator refers, uh, but I suspect my response on this issue would be the same as it has been on every other issue. Order. 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 Well, yes, we could, we could just allow Senator, Senator McDonald Wong, to answer, I suppose. It could be an interesting, the interesting conversation between him and Senator Edwards. Senator Wong. Uh, Order. Senator Wong, continue. Thank you, Mr President. I, I suspect my answer on this would be the same as on other issues. The first point is the materiality point, which is that uh, uh, you have to be careful in uh, suggesting that the entirety of a of uh, an electricity price increase as, as a result of the carbon price, because self-evidently and demonstrably that is untrue. Uh, and I've gone through that. Even, even Mr Turnbull uh, and uh, uh, the uh, member, 
and the opposition spokesperson has also recognised this, that the, the majority of price increases that people have experienced in the last years have been as a result of network costs, not as a result of carbon price. The second point I'd make, and I'll make again, is that the government did assume uh, that uh, uh, there would be cost passed through. Uh, there would be uh, an impact on the consumer price index of about 0.7 per cent. In fact, for food it was less, uh, and that has been factored into the household assistance package. And I went through in response to Senator Birmingham uh, the hundreds of thousands of South Australians uh, who will get assistance under the government's clean energy future package, uh, which is obviously relevant uh, to the question the senator asks. Uh, and if the senator does care about jobs, I would hope he would recognise that this government has, under this government, we have seen 810,000 jobs Time has expired. Created. Time to expire. Senator Edwards. Second question of the minister, Mr. President, and on the point of materiality of entirety, as you coin it, I refer the minister to the fact that the owner of Pete's Fish Farm described the carbon tax as the final nail in the coffin, with no hope of passing on the additional cost to consumers. Given the Prime Minister said yesterday that small businesses should just pass on the costs of carbon tax to consumers, does this just confirm that Labor doesn't understand small business or just doesn't care? When there's silence, we'll proceed. Order. 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 Senator Wong. Mr. President, the government does understand the, uh, uh, the circumstances of many of Australia's small businesses, which is why we wanted to provide a tax cut to them, opposed by the, those opposite. Uh, that's why we put in place an instant asset write off, an increased tax break for small business, opposed by those opposite. And if the senator doesn't know, he has been committed by his shadow finance minister to rev revoke that. Uh, to impose a tax hike on small business. Uh, that the government does understand the needs of small business and big business, which is why we have a lost carryback policy funded in the last budget, the vast majority of which the vast majority of which will be to the benefit of small business, who will be, uh, by, by gr a great margin, uh, the majority of recipients uh, in Treasury's assessment of that tax assistance, of that tax break. All of these things opposed by those opposite. So if the senator wants to come in here and lecture us about small business, suggest he goes to them and explain why he thinks they should pay more tax. Order. Minister, uh, the, uh, senator Edwards. Uh, final question of the minister. Given the carbon tax will make margins for small businesses even lower, resulting in many business owners walking away from the businesses they run and the people they employ, how many more victims will the carbon tax have to claim before the government axes this cruel tax? Order. 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 The Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, can I suggest, you know, with the words of that question, he just demonstrates the confected outrage from a bloke who is part of a party that said we're not going to we're not going to pass on we're not going to pass a company tax cut with a head start for small business. Oh no, we don't want that. We don't want a tax break through an instant asset write-off for small business. Oh no, we don't want that. We don't want lost carry back for small business. Oh no, we don't want that. To come in here and give us a lecture about why, why small business is doing it tough when you have stood in the way of the policies of this government to give tax breaks to small business, when you are going to go to the next election and say to all small businesses, guess what, we're going to give you a tax hike. Well, Senator, I think, I think how genuine you are or you are not is demonstrated by the policy position you are holding. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for School Education, Senator Kim Carr. Can the minister inform the Senator of the nature of the government's investments in Australia's public schools? The Minister representing the Minister for School Education, Senator Kim Carr. Thank the Senator for her question and uh, acknowledge her long standing expertise in education. The government is very proud of the money that it's invested in schools, whether they be public, whether they be private, whether they be a Catholic. Our, on our watch, investment, as I think I've already indicated, has doubled. Uh, what we're seeing now, if you look at uh, the table, uh, 2.5 and budget paper number three 
in the four years, in the next four years, the government will provide an estimated $20.9 billion to state governments to support state education in government schools. Now, of that, $17.8 billion will be government, uh, government schools under the national schools special purpose payments. Now, I specifically draw the Senate's attention to the fact that we are providing $1.5 billion to lift the performance of the most disadvantaged schools in the Commonwealth. We are investing record levels in all public schools. That's at the moment. This is before, before the Gone Scheme uh, response is made. There's to nearly 2.3 million Australian children in those schools. 2.3 million. Two thirds of the children of this generation. Well, well, Lord Brandis, you ought to know something order, about class war order, when it comes to education. Order, Senator, S Senator, Senator, Carr, Brandis, Senator Carr, you will refer to another Senator, Senator, Senator by Brandis. their correct title. Sure, when Senator Brandis lines up to support Mr order. Abbott's cuts Keep going. to public education, he will of course recognise that 85 per cent, 85 per cent of Indigenous children attend public schools. 83 per cent of children from remote and regional areas attend public schools. 80 per cent of students from the lowest income brackets attend public schools. 78 per cent of students with a disability attend public schools. These are the people you are attacking. When you say there is an injustice in the level of support Time for public education— Time has expired. Time's expired, Senator Kim Carr. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Mr President. How does the government respond to concerns that students in public schools get more than their fair share? No, I'll, I'll give you the call when there's silence, Senator Kim Carr. I'll give you the call when there's silence. You're entitled to be heard in silence. Senator Kim Carr. Mr. President, Mr. Abbott said yesterday, so there is no question of injustice to public schools here. If anything, the injustice is the other way. He made the statement that we are in fact providing an injustice when we talk about public education support at this moment. Now, of course, this is the position. This is the position, as I say, that would seriously weaken public education in rural and regional Australia. This is a position that would seriously undermine the capacity of this country to remain what level of equality we're provided. I'd ask a simple question: of the 17.8 billion for special purpose payments to the states. How much of that would be cut to provide justice under a Liberal government? How much would be cut? Which schools would be cut? Which groups, which groups of disadvantaged Australians would miss out as a result of the policies of, of, Mr, of, of Mr Abbott if they were ever implemented? Because that's the proposition he's advancing. There's an injustice in the level of support. He wants to write Time that. Time has that expired, means cut. Senator Kim Carr. Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe. You got the call. Mr President, is the government confident that its investments can be justified in the context of a tough fiscal climate? Call the Minister. Mr President, the Labor, the Labor point of view, the Labor point of view is that there can be no higher priority than spending on education. This is the basic premise on which we operate. What we say, of course, is that you don't take money off the poor to give to the rich. We actually say that every Australian is entitled to a fair go. Now, what we have seen, under, for instance, in Victoria, where we have a Liberal government, some real examples of real action, 3,600 staff have been cut from the public service, 550 from the education department, $19 million cut from schools uh, start bonus for struggling families, where some $300 million cut from TAFE funding. What we've seen, of course, in Queensland is a similar pattern, where the Premier of that state argues that there should be 20,000 less public servants, and he's already got rid of 7,000 of them. We, of course, know what Jeff Kennett's attitude has been, where he said that all state budgets needed to be savaged. That was the word Time's that he expired. used. Savage. Time has expired. Send her back. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, my question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Ludwig. Can the minister confirm that the Indonesian government has effectively halved the quota for both live cattle and boxed beef exported from Australia over the last 12 months, and that they're now imposing a 5 per cent import tariff on all cattle from Australia and are demanding a pedigree certificate for all commercial breeding stock sent to Indonesia? Mr. President, will the minister admit that these trade restrictions are as a direct result of him suspending the shipment of live cattle to Indonesia last year? And will he advise what action the Australian government is taking to restore this critically important trade in both live cattle and boxed meat with our nearest trading partner? The Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Back for his uh, question. Uh, can I say that Australia has a strong relationship with Indonesia, and our governments continue to work uh, together. Uh, in July, I travelled to Darwin to take part in a meeting with Indonesian government as part of a wider Australian government delegation to discuss the broader bilateral relationship. I also joined the members of the Indonesian government delegation led by the President, uh, President Yudhoyono, at that lunch hosted by the Australian Indonesian Business Council. And while in Darwin, I also met with the agricultural industry to discuss trade with Indonesia and domestic opportunities across a number of agricultural commodities, including a live cattle trade. Market access issues were issues which were raised and were high on the agenda, as was the call from the Indonesian uh, to domestic investment from the Australian industry. The Australian government encourages a mutually beneficial investment in the in, in, in Indonesian agricultural sector, and that strengthens the bilateral arrangements. Uh, turning to uh, the specific issues raised, breeder cattle consignments, DAF is aware that is the department that at least one consignment of Australian breeder cattle has uh, not been released to the Indonesian importers by Indonesian authorities, and the department understands that that Indonesian authorities are seeking clarification of the pedigree of these animals. The Australian government has not been notified of any changes to Indonesia's requirements for information about the pedigree of imported breeder cattle. The Australian government does not certify the pedigree of breeder cattle for the Indonesian market. These are uh, directly commercial matters. The government is consulting with the Australian livestock exporters on the issue and will make appropriate representations to the Indonesian government if necessary. Uh, in terms of the uh, cattle, uh, live cattle import tariffs, of course, I can add I'm aware of industry Time's concerns. Time's expired. Senator Ludwig, send her back. Mr. President, is the minister aware of reports that Indonesian government ministers have stated they now intend to import beef and buffalo meat from so-called foot and mouth disease free zones in affected countries such as Brazil and from India, whose herds are endemic for foot and mouth disease? Can he explain what measures he's taking to prevent such an action? given the high risk of diseases such as foot and mouth disease, contagious bovine pleuropneumonia and meat-borne diseases affecting humans, which will reach Indonesia and possibly Australia. The Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I thank uh, Senator Back for his continued scare campaign across these areas. Uh, can I say, uh, can I say the, uh, and Order. can I then say that Australia, the Australia Live Order, order, order on both sides. Senator Ludwig. Thank you. Can I then say that the Australian live export trade, uh, right across between Australia and Indonesia and other markets, continues to support jobs, families, and communities right across uh, regional Australia? The government's reforms place animal welfare at the heart of the live export trade. This new system does provide the supply chain the control of the animals that leave Australia into, into, into foreign markets uh, for, uh, for a range of, of, of support right across. Uh, we have a system in place that identifies us uh, to ensure that we have supply chains and that we have uh, a secure supply chain. Those opposite, of course, are arguing, are arguing against a secure supply chain. What they want is poor Time's animal expired. welfare Senator outcomes. Ludwig, order. Senator back. Thank you, Mr President. This is the secure supply chain. Will the minister confirm that Indian buffalo meat is being packaged and labelled as product of Australia, then sold illegally into Indonesia, and that the catalyst for this highly damaging trade 
is in direct response to the doubling and even trebling of beef prices in Indonesian villages due to the cut in supply of beef from Australia due to the minister's actions. The minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Again, Senator Back uh, wants to uh, dwell on a scare campaign. If he's got any evidence, if he's got any evidence of this, uh, then he should provide it to the relevant authorities. What is important to recognise is that this government continues to support the live animal export industry. We continue to ensure that it, it manages its animal welfare issues. Those opposite want to ignore that. Those opposite would ensure that animal, poor animal welfare outcomes would result. They would ensure that the trade would not have a bright future. They would make sure that the industry would not be able to have an animal welfare outcome. That is the position that the opposition have done. And of course, one of the, one of, uh, one of the uh, areas that the animal welfare outcome that the opposition want to do is take away the supply chain. They want to ensure that the supply chain does not ensure that animal welfare outcomes are dealt with. And all they want to do is harp on the negative scare campaign on this industry. It's Order. about time. It's about time that Senator Waters. Thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Sustainability, Environment, Water, Population and Communities, Senator Conroy. Last night's Four Corners program highlighted the plight of our national icon, the koala. It showed how tragically koala populations in New South Wales and Queensland Order. are crashing. Order. Or, on my right and on my left. Order. Order. S Senator Conroy is entitled to hear the question, and Senator Waters is entitled to be heard. No. Order. Senator Waters. Thank you, Mr. President. Last night's program showed how koala populations in New South Wales and Queensland are crashing, threatened by climate change, disease, dogs, and rampant land clearing from both urban development and mining. <clears throat> in April this year, Minister Burke gained the ability to protect koalas from big developments in Queensland, New South Wales, and the ACT when koalas were added to the federal threatened species list, following a Senate inquiry that, uh, into koalas instigated by the Greens. Minister Burke said on Four Corners, the only reason we've had to intervene at all is that the states on their own have allowed numbers to continue to go into freefall. So why, through April's COAG agreement, has the government agreed to hand off federal responsibility for threatened species, including koalas, right back to the states, who are the ones sending koalas to extinction? Order. Order. The minister representing the minister for... Order. The Minister representing the Minister for Sustainability, Environment, Water, Population and Community. Senator, Senator Conroy. I thank the Senator for her question. Mr President, the Gillard government is committed to the protection and recovery of the koala, one of Australia's iconic species. Koalas hold a special place in our community, a special place. That's why we have taken action to help protect just, the koala, just, Mr. What, President. Just resume your seat. Yeah. Yeah, Senator Waters is entitled to hear the answer. So when there's silence, we'll proceed. On both sides. Sit down. Just resume your seat. When, when there's silence, Senator Waters is entitled to hear the answer. Senator Conroy. That's why we have taken action to help protect the koala for future generations, Mr. President, by listing it as a vulnerable species under the national environmental law. The Queensland, New South Wales, and ACT koala populations continue to be under serious threat from habitat loss, vehicle strikes, dog attacks Senator Conroy, and disease. Just, just resume your seat. <laughs> Senator Waters, I repeat again, is entitled to hear the answer. Senator Conroy. 
Mr. President, these populations have been listed as a vulnerable species. This listing gives the koala an extra layer of protection. The koala is, as I've said, a national icon, and national protection provides for consistent treatment of the koala under national environmental law and standards, rather than the previous state-by-state -state based approach. Any new development likely to have a significant impact on koalas in Queensland, New South Wales and the ACT must be assessed and approved under national environment law. As a result of listing, a national recovery plan is being developed for koalas within Queensland, New South Wales and the ACT. The recovery plan will be multi-jurisdictional and present a stronger scientific basis for protection of the species. Mr President, the Australian Government has been leading a national environmental law reform process through COAG. The COAG agreement is about streamlining the processes to give business answers on environmental decisions in a better time frame. It is about the state governments having to raise their standards to the Commonwealth standards. This Labor government has absolutely no intention of allowing any state to use the COAG process as a way of lowering environmental standards. We are serious, order. Mr. President. Time has expired, Senator Conroy. Order, order, in the waters. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank the minister for his answer. A supplementary question: The koala has been estimated to contribute over one billion dollars annually in tourism dollars. Minister Burke said last night that state processes were sending koalas on a path of extinction in the wild, which he said was absolutely not good enough, and that that was Just why we send, had. Senator Waters. You, you will resume your seat. Continue, Senator Waters. Thanks, President. Uh, minister Burke said that that was why we had environmental regulation. So, what does the minister say to tourism operators about the federal government now ditching its new responsibilities to look after koalas and leaving their survival to the whim of the states, those same states which have driven the huge decline in koala numbers? The Minister. Mr President, we reject the premise of that assertion. This government is serious about maintaining environmental standards, including for the koala and its habitat. The Gillard government has committed $300,000 of new funding under the National Environmental Research Program to find out more about koala habitat. This funding will be used to develop new survey methods that will improve our knowledge of the quality of koala habitat using remote sensing and help fill important data gaps to enhance our understanding and ability to protect the species. Over $10 million was approved under the first round of the Biodiversity Fund for six projects in New South Wales and one in Victoria aimed at rehabilitation, restoration and linking of koala habitat. And if there's any further information there on the question, I will seek that from Mr. Minister Burke. Senator Waters. Mr. President, a second supplementary. Why is the government so eager to abandon its responsibility to protect our nationally significant environmental matters, like koalas, other threatened species, migratory species, national heritage places, and Ramsar wetlands? How, given the consistent poor record of the states to protect those places or to comply with standards that already exist, can you possibly think that is consistent with our international obligations? The Minister. Mr President, as I said, I fundamentally reject this government fundamentally rejects the assertions that are the premise of that question. It is not true. I've just outlined on behalf of Minister Burke a whole range of protections and made the absolute point, and I'll make it again, that we will not allow the lowering of standards as part of this process. We will not allow, and we will not allow the Greens to represent that that is the case. If there's any further information that uh, the minister might like to respond to, I will seek that for you. Senator Bushby. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Ludwig. I refer to reports that Dean Mile, boss of the ETU, a significant donor to the Australian Labor Party and to the Australian Greens, is the subject of an internal audit for the sale of the majority stake in an ETU financial advisory firm for a tenth of its value, a potential loss of half a million dollars of union members' funds, and further that statements made by Mr Mile that the ETU continued to receive funds have been contradicted by Mr Tony Devlin, who took full control of Southern Alliance Financial Services. Is Fair Work Australia investigating these matters to ensure that union members' funds are not being misspent and if not, why not? 
The mi Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and, and I thank Senator Bush for his uh, question. Uh, can I say, uh, in terms of Victorian Electrical Trade Union allegations, under this government, uh, the regulation of registered organisations and financial service providers has never been stronger, if I could make that point. Uh, we, have recently amended, we have recently amended the Fair Work Registered Organisations Act to require officers uh, must disclose material personal interest in a matter that relates to the affairs of their organisational branch, and that obligation extends to the uh, officer or or a relative of the officer, uh, and organisations and branches must disclose uh, this information to members. Uh, we have introduced tough new laws to tackle conflict of interest in financial planning and superannuation. Uh, we have also changes made also require organisations and branches to disclose payments that have been made to related parties of the organisational branch and other persons or bodies. A related body is defined to include entities that are controlled by organisations or officials of the organisation. Uh, trade unions are, can I then say, overwhelmingly uh, professional democratic uh, and they represent the interests of members and they do that in a highly effective way. Uh, Australia has had, a long, has had a long and free independent movement, trade union movement that is representative of and accountable to its members. Trade unions are overwhelmingly, as I said, professional, democratic and highly effective. Uh, the CEPU has advised the Fair Work, uh, organize, uh, Fair Work Australia of federal court proceedings, and FWA is monitoring. Order. Senator Betts. The question was about the ETU. And, and, and. Order. Order. Or, order. And the question was whether or not Fair Work Australia was investigating the matter to which Senator Bushby referred to in his question. The, not a broad question order. at all, Mr. I'm listening President. closely to the answer, Senator Abetz. I don't believe there's a point of order at this stage. Senator Ludwig. Uh, and, and what I was going to go on to say before uh, uh, Senator Abetz uh, provided his lack of knowledge across industrial relations is that uh, FWA uh, is independent of government and, and the Libs uh, should understand order. that by now. Order. Uh, order, Senator oh. Ludwig. Order. Order. Senator Bushby. Thank you, Mr President. I, I have a supplementary question. I refer to reports that the bosses of the Australian Maritime Union, which is affiliated with and a major donor to the Labor Party, is hindering police and government efforts to clean up the ports following allegations of rampant corruption, crime, gangs, arms smuggling and drugs. Is, is Fair Work Australia investigating these matters as possible contraventions of the Fair Work Registered Organisations Act? What are the, the Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I thank, uh, I thank the Senator for his, uh, his interest. Uh, his ongoing interest in industrial relations, uh, dealing with, of course, uh, uh, news reports today concerning allegations against. Uh, perhaps it's worthwhile finalising the Victorian ETU matter. Are the subject uh, uh, are the subject of federal court proceedings, uh, and of course, uh, this government is on the side of accountability uh, for representative uh, organisations. Uh, we propose uh, and have uh, moved the Fair Work uh, Act. To deal with that, if there are allegations, if there are allegations of, of impropriety, then they should be reported to the relevant bodies so that they can be investigated. If the senator has information uh, that is relevant, uh, then he should refer the matter. He should not sit on it and use it in question time. Uh, but I'm confident that Fair Work Australia, uh, as an independent body, will independently investigate. Uh, matters uh, that, you then, if you then say are true, uh, can be raised and put to it. Time has expired. Senator Bushby. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I have a further supplementary question. I note the minister, in his uh, answer to his, the primary question, mentioned the CEPU. So I refer to concerns about the bosses of the CEPU, also a Labor donor, engaging in unauthorised rule changes, a huge budget deficit and money being spent on private motor vehicles and other things. Is Fair Work Australia investigating these matters as possible contraventions of the Fair Work Registered Organisations Act? In relation to all of these matters, will Fair Work Australia be as speedy as they were with their investigation into the Health Services Union? 
The Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank uh, the Senator for his uh, question. As I was saying, uh, if he does have, if he does have, Mr. President, uh, evidence of the serious allegations that he raised, he should he should provide them to the relevant authority. I am confident that Fair Work Australia. Uh, uh, as its charter is, will investigate all of those matters if they have substance, if they have substance that are brought to the attention. I will ask, I will ask the uh, minister Shorten if there is further matters that he uh, wishes to respond to the second supplementary question. Senator Gallagher. To the uh, minister for broadband communications and the digital digital economy, Senator Conroy. Has the minister seen the recent statement by Jeremy Hunt about the UK's ambition for broadband, and does this have implications for Australian broadband policy? Minister for Broadband Communication and the Digital Economy, Senator Conroy. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Can I thank Senator for his question? I, uh, in the Australian Financial Review today, the member for Wentworth has again used the plans of BT in the UK as the model for his broadband policy. Well, Mr President, the UK minister responsible for communications, Mr Jeremy Hunt, doesn't seem to agree with his Conservative colleague on the importance of broadband policy. Yesterday, Minister Hunt emphasised the need to get broadband policy right. And here's what he had to say. This is Mr Hunt. My nightmare is that when it comes to broadband, we could make the same mistake as we made with high-speed rail. When a high-speed rail network opens from London to Birmingham in 2026, it will be 45 years after the French opened theirs and 62 years after the Japanese opened theirs. Just think how much our economy has been held back by lower productivity over half a century. We must not make the same short-sighted mistake. And he went on to say, we must never fall into the trap of saying any speed is enough. Today's super fast is tomorrow's super slow. Well, Mr President, Minister Hunt went on to respond to a House of Lords committee saying they suggest that fibre to the Cabinet is the sum of the government's ambitions. They are wrong. Where fibre to the cabinet is the chosen solution, it is most likely to be a temporary stepping stone to fibre to the home. That's right, Mr President, a temporary stepping stone to fibre to the home. Well, Mr Hunt has demonstrated the short-sighted vision of those opposite and particularly the short-sighted, cowardly approach, Mr President, that those down in that far corner are showing on behalf of their constituents. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My, second, uh, my first supplementary is, can the minister advise whether fibre to the node has been considered by the Australian government and is the minister aware of fibre to the node developments in other markets close to Australia? Minister. Thank you. And uh, yes, you are right, Senator Birmingham. But the government did initially, Mr. President, consider an FTTN solution. As senators would be aware, and Senator Birmingham is interjecting, we went to tender and could not find a commercial partner for that solution. But more significantly, more significantly, Mr. President, the expert panel with some of Australia's finest minds in telecommunications that evaluated the tender advised the government that FTTP was the future for broadband. To the premise, Mr. President, FTTN is a costly diversion from the ultimate path of fibre to the home and does not offer value for taxpayers' dollars. That's what the experts said. Now, I know the experts are not something that others on those of the opposite side like to take any notice of, Mr. President. But just like the New Zealand government abandoned midstream their fibre to the node build to build fibre to the premise, Mr. Order. Turnbull and those opposite Time has are being expired. Expert. Time has expired, Senator Conroy. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My uh, second supplementary. Is the minister aware of other, any other countries where fibre to the premises networks are being built? Order. The minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Turnbull told us to look at the UK. Mr. Turnbull told us to look at New Zealand. 
Well, we've seen that both of those are turning to fibre to the premise. But Mr Turnbull didn't mention France. And you might ask, why didn't he mention France? Because France, Mr President, is building a fibre to the home network to 15 million French by 2020. And does Mr Turnbull know about France, Mr President? Well, let me turn to Mr Turnbull's declaration of interest, which he has just released, about his own personal investments. Did he invest, Mr President, in British Telecom? No. Has he invested in New Zealand's Telecom's chorus? No. no. Did he inv invest in French Telecom and its fibre to the home network? Yes. Oh. Yes. Well, Mr Turnbull knows the business plan he sees it, but what he should be doing is putting his mouth where his money is. Order. Put his mouth Order, where his money Senator is. Conroy. In fibre to the home. Senator Conroy, your time's expired. Senator Evans. They ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Order. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, I move that the Senate take note of answers uh, given to uh, questions from uh, myself, Senator Edwards and Senator Back, by Senator Wong and Senator Ludwig. And Mr Deputy President, in listening to, in listening to uh, Senator Wong, in listening to uh, the Prime Minister and listening to everybody in the government at present, I have to say I'm, I'm starting to wonder a few things about the carbon tax package. I'm starting to wonder why there's any compensation or so-called compensation attached to the carbon tax package at all. I'm starting to wonder how it is when I look at the budget papers and see that they claim that the carbon tax will generate billions of dollars annually in revenue as to how that is the case and whether in fact that is a gigantic mistake in the budget papers. Because, Mr Deputy President, when I listen to the Prime Minister, when I listen to Minister Wong, when I listen to ministers across this government or members across this government, I'm left with the impression that the carbon tax has no impact at all. I'm left with the impression that it's not having any cost anywhere on anything. Because it seems that every time a question is asked, all that we hear from the government, all that we hear from the Prime Minister, from Minister Combe or Minister Wong or anybody else, is that it's all the fault of the state's price rises. It's all the fault of the networks, these price rises. It's all the fault of anything, anything else, except, of course, the government's own carbon tax. Well, Mr Deputy President, we know that this is just a falsehood. We know that the government is, of course, misleading misleading the Australian people through this claim, through this pretence, that all cost rises are somehow the result of anything other than the carbon tax. How do we know this, Mr Deputy President? Well, we know it because we have the facts to demonstrate it. We have the facts, and those facts stem originally from the government's own Treasury modelling, modelling that demonstrated the carbon tax would have a 9 per cent rise on electricity prices, and that that, of course, would then be felt with further increases over subsequent years. Has that modelling proven to be true? By and large, it has, Mr Deputy President. How do we know that? Because we have the facts of what has happened state by state to electricity prices since the carbon tax. We know that in New South Wales, yes, prices have gone up 18.1%. And it is correct to say that's not all attributable to the carbon tax. But 8.9 per cent of that increase is attributable to the carbon tax. So because of Labor's carbon tax, power prices in New South Wales are now 8.9 per cent higher, and they, of course, will keep going up and up and up with the carbon tax. We know that in Queensland, the estimate is that of the 13.1 per cent increase in electricity prices, 11 per cent of that is attributable to the carbon tax. 
So Queenslanders are paying 11 per cent more on their electricity bills as a result of the carbon tax. We know that West Australians are paying 9.1 per cent more. People here in the ACT, Mr Deputy President, they are paying 14.2 per cent extra on their electricity bills as a result of Labor's carbon tax. The lowest state, the state with the smallest increase as a result of the carbon tax, is my own home state, Mr Deputy President. In South Australia, the carbon tax has only just pushed prices up, apparently, by about 4.6 per cent. Why? Because we already had the highest electricity prices in the country. We already were more dependent on wind and higher cost sources of energy to start with. And that, of course, means we still have the highest prices in the country. So for all that we hear from those opposite and from Minister Wong, as we did today in question time, where she tries to pretend the carbon tax or electricity price rises are all somebody else's fault, the evidence is speaking for itself. The government's modelling has been correct. People are facing a 10 per cent rice rise across the board as a result of the carbon tax. Whether it is sporting clubs, as I asked the minister about today, whether it's pubs or clubs generally, whether it's small businesses, none of them get any compensation. The minister could not identify a single one today who was receiving any compensation to a club or a small business as a result of these price rises, but all of them are facing real price rises. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator uh, McEwen. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy President. Uh, I too would like to contribute to this debate today and uh, um, put to rest some of the outrageous claims made, by, in particular, by Senator Birmingham and Senator Edwards over there. It's disappointing to see um, those two South Australian senators continue on the scare campaign, which has been perfected by their leader, uh, Mr Abbott. Um, and to see them join the, the parade around the country of uh, Mr Abbott, where he talks down the economy, he talks down the jobs that are being created in Australia by this government, and he frightens people into believing that uh, pretty soon we're going to have Armageddon. Last time I looked, Wyala was still there and doing pretty well. Um, the opposition neglect to tell the people, the, the whole, the people of Australia the, the whole story of the policy of tackling climate change, and they certainly yeah. forget to tell the people of Australia that they too actually believe in reducing harmful carbon emissions, and uh, that they have a policy to do that and to achieve exactly the same targets in reducing carbon emissions that the federal government has. And they went to the election, the last election, with that policy as well. It's just that they have a different way of going about it, Mr uh, Deputy President. Their way of going about it is to slug every household in Australia with a bill of $1,300 for their ridiculous and inefficient direct action plan. It's very disappointing that Senator Birmingham, um, who used to be a moderate in this space, has uh, turned to the dark side. Uh, when it comes to tackling climate change and has to spout um, the position of his leader, which we know he probably doesn't really believe. The uh, opposition is also pretty good at uh, neglecting to tell Australians that, in fact, we are in good shape here compared to other countries. Senator Wong said in one of her answers today that under this government 800,000 new jobs have been created in Australia under the government. There are record investments in the pipeline in Australia, particularly in mining and especially in our home state of South Australia. We have low unemployment. Mr Deputy President, and we're on track to return the budget to a surplus. These are things that we should be proud of and we shouldn't be talking it down. The, uh, the opposition also don't tell Australians the real, the real story of uh, why uh, electricity prices are increasing. And we know that average electricity bills went up by 50 per cent in the last four years before the carbon price. And the most important driver of power prices going up is investment in network infrastructure. And now every consumer, for every $100 you pay on your power bill, $51 of that is to go towards the cost of infrastructure. And yes, that's because state governments have neglected to build infrastructure. And we could probably go back in time in history in South Australia and pinpoint a time when the Liberals privatised electricity as when the price of infrastructure where the infrastructure was not built because of the privatised system, and now state governments are having to play catch up in that space. Treasury, Treasury modelling shows that um, under a carbon price, 
Um, there will, of course, be a moderate increase to the cost of living for average households and for businesses. We've never hidden that fact, and we put in compensatory mechanisms to deal with that fact, including, including an average uh, increase in household uh, payments of $10, 10 cents per week, which is, outstrips the $3.30 average increase in a household bill. We also know that we've put in place lots of mechanisms to assist small businesses to deal with uh, the increased cost from uh, the price on carbon, and that includes the $6,500 instant asset write-off, which I can tell you is very popular, very popular in the small businesses that I talk to around the place. And I, and I remind Australian small businesses that they can make a claim for that asset write-off for every asset purchase that they make. Uh, we also uh, know that power costs are actually, actually quite a small component of the average small business um, costs. But we should not forget in this whole debate the reason for the carbon price is so that polluters, the big polluters, the 500 or so companies, less than that actually, of big polluters in Australia actually pay for polluting. And yes, they will pass on some of those costs. And yes, the government has acknowledged that and put in place numerous mechanisms to offset those small costs that are passed on down the line. And it would be nice if the uh, federal opposition actually told the truth instead of continuing the scaremongering and the fear campaign that they've waged uh, ad nauseum. Um, Australia is beginning to understand that they're dealing with people Order. who fail Senator to tell McEwen, the truth. Your time has expired. Senator Edwards. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Wong. Uh, and, uh, in one of her answers, she uh, uh, made reference to the performance of my colleague, Senator Birmingham's uh, inaugural uh, appearance on Q&A last night. Well, I must say that uh, when she awarded the Senator Birmingham's performance second to uh, uh, Senator Cameron, I was astounded because, in actual fact, if you hadn't been a participant in the Australian political race uh, or, or a, an observer of it, you wouldn't know whether uh, Senator Birmingham had two of his other parliamentary colleagues sitting alongside of him in uh, Senator Cameron and former minister in a Labor government, uh, our very own Graham Richardson. So uh, I thought they all put in a very good performance in a, in a, in a great critique of this current Labor government. So, so on that basis, I thank Senator Birmingham for his leadership in that debate last night on uh, the ABC. So, uh, I, uh, I do also concur with uh, Senator Birmingham's uh, remarks about the fact that where is this mysterious $7.8 billion going to come from? Because every time we do ask a question of the Labor Party or, or the minister representing uh, the Minister for Energy and Climate Change, where it's going to come from, apparently it's not going to come from anybody, but we're going to have this compensation package which is going to fix anything anyway. Every time we ask a question about Pete's Fisheries or whether it be the Blair Hotel or uh, uh, the, the clubs in South Australia or Western Australia or Queensland, it is just going to be fixed with assistance. I noticed that there was reference to 300,000 pensioners but no, uh, for compensation, but no reference at all to clubs or those community organisations which rely so heavily on, uh, uh, on the energy costs uh, and the fact that the impact of the rising energy costs, which we say and we all acknowledge uh, by your very own modelling, and as Senator Birmingham quite rightly pointed out, varies from state to state, but is a massive impost on small business. The, uh, the jig's up, really, because I reckon that Robert Godleibson belled the cat this morning in uh, his 10.49am uh, article, Why the Carbon Tax Doesn't Work. And he refers to a group of Nobel laureates and other top experts, and I'm quoting him here, who combine to form the Copenhagen Consensus. And they believe that the world's emphasis on emissions reductions via carbon pricing and similar mechanisms is simply not going to work. They propose a cheaper but more radical global solution which the Labor Party and their policy makers should listen to. The Copenhagen Consensus was formed in Denmark to bring together, and I quote him again, 
top global knowledge to determine the best way to allocate funds to solve particular problems. And he went on to say, when it comes to carbon, they concluded that because electricity had become essential to the current living standards of a vast number of people on the globe, simply pricing electricity at higher levels would not make an enormous difference to usage. Now, the reason that they said this is because they refer to people trying to climb out of their poverty. They concluded that the most economic way to reduce global poverty was to make sure that preschool children have sufficient nutrition. And without preschool nutrition, adult capabilities are greatly reduced as there is much less productive members of the community. So this is, this is a big issue for those on the other side, and I don't hear it acknowledged at all. We need energy. This is sort of the carrot and the stick, except well, you've got the stick, whereas we, and they conclude, uh, and I paraphrase uh, this report, and I commend everybody to it today, uh, to that report, they, they conclude by saying and summarising that standards of living will be increased with the use of energy. However, we need to do development and research for better ways of renewable energy rather than to tax out of existence what we have here now. Now, just in reference to, Penny, uh, to Senator Wong's uh, other answers, she talked about uh, the tax cuts and uh, the asset write-offs and the, the carryback of losses. Well, I mean, isn't that testament? I can guarantee you in my business experience a 1 per cent tax cut on a business that's not making any money, Pete's Fish Farm at Kalangadu, who's not making Order. any money, Senator a 1 per cent— your time has expired. Senator Stirl. Oh. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Um, I wasn't going to mention it, but unfortunately I didn't see— I won't say unfortunately. I didn't see Q&A last night, and I'm sure the senators in this place uh, did their parties proud? I had something far more important than watching Q&A. I had to sort out my sock drawer. But on that, I rise to take note of questions, or a question from Senator Back to, uh, to uh, Minister Ludwig. And I heard the uh, comment that what would he know? And someone said he's a, he's a vet. Regardless of uh, Senator Back, Dr Back, who I do have uh, admiration for, I work very closely with him, even when he is dishing it up to me as I'm walking out the chamber here the other day. Quite fairly, you got one in for free, Senator Back, through you, Mr Deputy President, but we'll have the chance to square the ledger somewhere along the line. Um, but in terms of the live export trade, Mr Deputy, Deputy President, I, I do stand in this building as a very proud Senator for Western Australia. Those who do know my whereabouts, hopefully, uh, um, hopefully not as many as I, uh, as I think might, but uh, I do haunt the Kimberley. I proudly haunt the Kimberley. At every opportunity, I am in the Kimberley, whether it be in the west or the east. The uh, live export trade is very topical. Pastoral and, 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 and live cattle, cattle, beef in the Kimberley is the main industry in the Kimberley. It's not the only part of Western Australia, for those who might not know, but also the Pilbara. But I also do know, Mr Acting Deputy President, when the live export ban was on and the Rural, Regional Affairs and Transport References Committee conducted a number of inquiries around the top end of Australia and also one here in Canberra. And I made sure that I was in Broome to hear from the pastoralists who were affected not only the Kimberley pastoralists and the Pilbara pastoralists, but also representatives from the 22 Kimberley Aboriginal pastoralists. Uh, they have their own little association headed by Dilly Lawford out of Bohemia Downs. I know the drama that that created, I, the, that, that is the ban on the live export trade, and I honestly, on the hand on my heart, know the pain that would have given the minister to have to put that ban on. But let's just talk about that ban, the ban that did last a month, and yes, it did get everyone jumping who has an interest in live export, not only the pastoralists but also those that rely on cattle for a living. Numerous truckies, trucking companies, truck drivers, auto electricians, tyre suppliers, fencing suppliers, local shops in those uh, regional towns and rural towns, uh, also um, a host of other businesses. And let me talk just from the West Kimberley perspective of the towns of Broome and Derby. And people think that Broome is bubbling. It is the dry season. It is normally the height of the tourist season, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Tourism is really suffering. Trust me. 
they are suffering. The high Australian dollar is making it very hard. But I've also got to tell you, Mr Acting Deputy President, I know Senator Back will back me on this, the pearling industry is all but defunct. They're struggling. So cattle, live export is very important. But Mr Acting Deputy President, you know, I think it's unfair that the way everyone has jumped on the government. Let's go back. Let's take a couple of steps back to that, I, I call it that, shocking behaviour on behalf of Animals Australia and RSPCA. And I'll tell you why. It was right of them to bring to the attention of the government mistreatment of animals. They sat on that for months. For months and months they sat on it. If they were fair dinkum, they'd have been in here that quick that they would have burnt the carpet trying to get to the minister's office. I stand supportive of the live cattle industry. I would much rather see a more active uh, boxed meat industry. Uh, nothing would give me greater pleasure than to go back to my old trucking days when there was an abattoir in Kununurra, there was an abattoir in Wyndham, there was an abattoir in Broome, there was one in Derby, there was one also not cattle but in Carnarvon. And I think Port Hedland might have had some activity around there. And I remember all those uh, meat workers and businesses that relied on the live export cattle trade. I fully, fully stand shoulder to shoulder and support the government's decision to put the ban on because we had to lift our standards. There is no ifs or buts about that. It would be nice, and when I was at the PGA conference in Broome in June, I also said it would have been lovely if we could have done it without having to put a ban on. The sad reality is we had to put the ban on. We had to lift the standards of animal. Um, uh, treatments and to world-class standards in Indonesia. And I understand that the Indonesians have put some um, pressure on Australian growers. But I can tell you, Mr Acting Deputy President, from the PGA and in Broome, they're confident that their figures, the export figures, will return to pro-band. Order, days, Senator pre -band. Stirl, your time yes. has expired. Senator Back. Mr President, I rise and I thank Senator Stirl for the support he gave the industry last year. And had he not given it such support, perhaps the Industry would not have been returned quite as quickly, but I do remind Senator Stirl again that I did write to the minister in the days before he made that decision to suspend the trade, and I invited the opportunity to speak with him at length so that he could avert actually doing that. But, Deputy President, the matter of greatest concern to me today was the fact that when I raised in uh, my questions to uh, Senator Ludwig, uh, of whom I wish to take note of the answers, the simple fact that the matters that I raised were with him were of enormous concern to biosecurity in this country. Only yesterday did he answer a Dorothy Dixer from Senator Moore, in which he very proudly spoke of his role in protecting biosecurity in this country, when I raised with him the very real threats of a return of foot and mouth disease to Indonesia and subsequently to this country, when I put to him the possibility of a return of contagious bovine pleuropneumonia to this country, a disease that took us some 130 years to eradicate, all he could come back and say to me was a scare campaign. This is the minister who has got responsibility to the Australian community for one of our most important industries the third highest revenue export income earning industry for this country, and that is agriculture. And for Minister Ludwig to stand up here and claim that this side of the House, particularly myself, a veterinarian of some 40 years' experience, has no interest in biosecurity or in animal welfare matters is a deep insult to me. An absolute deep insult to me. A a Deputy President, I raised with him the question whether or not he is aware and can he confirm that beef is being illegally repackaged as product of Australia and being brought in to Indonesia from India, a country which is rife with foot and mouth disease and indeed contagious bovine pleuropneumonia. And the only retort he could give back to me was the fact that he regarded that as a scare campaign. Let me debunk, if I can, Deputy President, a theory which was put around this time last year about the live export trade, and that was if the live export trade was discontinued in any country of any type, it would be replaced with chilled or frozen, in other words, boxed meat. Deputy President, we know from our experience with Saudi Arabia in the 1980s when we lost the live export trade in sheep to Saudi Arabia for political purposes at that time, there was a concurrent drop-off and cessation of boxed beef and sheep meat sales 
to Saudi Arabia. And I'll have more to say about Saudi Arabia in coming days. But what we see evidence of at this very time is the fact the Indonesians, by way of punishing Australia through the act of Senator Ludwig in suspending the supply of protein to low socio-economic Indonesian families last year. The reprisals are many. We see the reprisals, do we not, in the attitude of the Indonesians in our attempts to solve the asylum seeker problem. We see this in the efforts of the Indonesian government now to actually accept the notion of accepting beef from the United States. Now, this is a market that's on our doorstep. On our doorstep. Would the Americans be keen to get into the Indonesian trade? Of course they would. Do we have a freight advantage? Yes, we do. But what's going to happen now in direct result of the fact of the insult visited upon Indonesia as a result of the actions of Senator Ludwig, actions that he did not need to take, I emphasise, we have a circumstance now in which the number of live cattle has been reduced this year to 283,000 animals, I say down from 770 in 2009, but at the same time we see a halving also of the amount of boxed chilled beef going into Indonesia, exactly in line with what we saw to Saudi Arabia years ago. And of course, as I have raised the point, another country that the Indonesian government ministers have said that they will seek to import beef from is Brazil. Now, not all of Brazil has foot and mouth disease, Deputy President. There are so called foot and mouth disease free zones. But we know that the leakage of movement of live cattle from foot and mouth disease zones into zones which are free of foot and mouth disease are very, very wide and loose. And I repeat the fear which has been expressed by the veterinary profession uh, and throughout the community that if we end up accepting beef from those countries into Indonesia, those diseases will return to Indonesia and with our poorest borders we will end up with them in Australia. Thank you, Senator Back. Uh, on a different matter, Senator Waters? Yes, Mr I'll Deputy President. I'll just put this motion first. The question is a motion moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of the answer given by Senator Conroy on behalf of the Minister for Sustainability, Environment, Water, Population and Communities. In response to my question on the government's plans to palm off its responsibilities to protect koalas in Queensland, New South Wales and the ACT. Uh, now, I don't know how many folk had the opportunity to see the Four Corners program on ABC last night, which documented the plight of our national icon, uh, but it was very alarming. And what it exposed was the fact that populations are crashing along those eastern states particularly in my state of Queensland, where we've seen uh, Mogollans populations and koalas in the so-called Koala Coast drop by up to 80 per cent in 10 years. Now, that's just an uh, unbelievably rapid decline, and it demonstrates just how urgent this problem is. Uh, now, I was really pleased that uh, former leader of the Greens, Senator Bob Brown, was successful in getting a Senate inquiry up into the status of koalas and their health and the need for their protection federally. Uh, and that Senate inquiry recommended some action, and ultimately it culminated in the federal minister listing the koala on our threatened species lists, which, while it being a very sad day for that to have to happen, does at least mean that the federal government can now do something to try and protect the koala and turn around that trajectory that's on a pathway to extinction. So that happened in April this year, um, and it meant that Minister Burke now has the power to do something to stop or to condition uh, big developments in koala habit habitat that are going to have a significant impact on koalas in Queensland, New South Wales and the ACT. Um, now, Minister Burke, I thought quite wisely and correctly last night acknowledged on the program that, uh, and I quote, the only reason we've had to intervene at all is that the states have on their own allowed numbers to continue to go into freefall. Now, he's exactly right, Mr Deputy President. Uh, under the state's wash, watch, we've seen koala populations completely bottom out and they are on a path to extinction in Queensland and New South Wales. So my question um, to the minister representing, which um, I found the answer to a little unsatisfactory, was why on earth, when the minister himself is acknowledging that the states are sending koalas to extinction, why on earth would the minister give away these new powers that he now has to protect koalas 
right back to those very state governments that are obliterating koalas and koala habitat. Uh, it, it makes absolutely no sense to me, Deputy President, and I was, I was eager to understand the government's reasoning. And un unfortunately, I still remain uh, perplexed as to, the, as to the logic behind that decision. Um, as, as listeners might know, in April, the Prime Minister capitulated to big business and state premiers uh, and agreed to hand off much of the federal government's powers to protect the environment. Uh, Hard-fought powers that have taken a good 30 years to, to gain and to expand with one stroke of a pen, responsibility for threatened species, for migratory species, uh, for Ramsar wetlands and for national heritage places, all of that was signed over to the states come March next year. Now, uh, folk might recall last week I spoke in the chamber about the terrible record the states have in upholding their obligations to protect the environment and the fact that they can't even comply with the existing standards to do that. I just am absolutely floored and flabbergasted as to why the federal government would have any trust that the, cov the government uh, at the state level can actually do its job to protect the environment. Uh, it is something that I think the Australian public would be outraged at. Uh, what is the point of stepping up and protecting koalas and then uh, shortly thereafter agreeing to give that power right back to the states who are, who are sending them on that trajectory of extinction? Uh, so, unfortunately, I'll, I'll continue to raise this issue, Deputy President, as it seems there's uh, no good reason behind the government's position and, unfortunately, no inclination to change that position. I would urge Australians who are concerned about koalas or who are concerned about our internationally significant wetlands, our migratory species, our heritage places—of course, the Kimberley is a great example—I would urge those people to write to the Prime Minister to write to Federal Minister Tony Burke uh, and to write to their local MP and please ask them to reconsider this decision to wash their hands of responsibility for those key icons and key species. The states have shown they won't protect the environment, they won't make those hard decisions. They'll simply give developers and miners everything they want. Um, Short-term profits will reign supreme uh, and future generations will, will feel the loss of those environmental icons. Uh, please, if you're concerned about Australia's environment, let the government know they must change their mind on handing off their powers to the states who will trash the environment and send our species to extinction. Thank you, Senator Waters. The question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it.